Threads of Fate is a rather unique game. It features two storylines from two different perspectives. One of them follows the adventure of a very mysterious boy named Rue. You will witness his quest to revive a lost friend and to discover his own forgotten past. The other story follows the adventure of an obnoxious and power-hungry princess named Mint. Both characters have a common goal, to find a powerful relic which will allow them to complete their quest. Rue relies heavily on his physical strength and morphing abilities, while Mint uses is her magic. The thing is that both systems are so different that you've got no choice but to play through the game on each scenario. With Rue, you collect monster coins from various enemies you defeat and can then transform into the slain monster. Mint's system is quite a bit different though. There are seven types of magic and seven different colours of magic. You start with two of each for a grand total of four spells. Throughout the game, you'll acquire new magic colours and types, each with different and unique usage. With such diversity and constant new additions, the gameplay never sees a dull moment as you're constantly learning new ways in which to accomplish your goal. The visuals are vibrant and colourful but not overly so and I found myself just sitting and admiring the details in several locations many times. The characters are made in a charming subdued anime style and all look fresh and full of personality and they all have their own individual movement and gestures that only that character can make. The monsters too are all very unique and are hardly ever recycled as you make your way through the game. Overall, this was a solid effort from Square, and a nice break from some of the better known series the company were known for. If you're looking for a shorter PlayStation RPG that is easy to dive into but hard to master, with overall simple gameplay mechanics and some interesting story quirks, this is a great game to try. Shadow Hearts, as many people are well aware, is a great series of PlayStation 2 RPGs that were a refreshing take on the tired tropes of the genre. So what does Kadelka have to do with any of this? Well, it was actually the first game created by the team who would later work on Shadow Hearts, and it's clear that many of the themes and ideas introduced with it would go on to influence the PlayStation 2 series as a whole. Now, the game takes place in my home country of Wales, and sees you filling the shoes of a young woman known as Kadelka, a crew cynical and venomously tongued woman. She's entirely aware of her own considerable magic and intellectual powers and has no hesitance in holding them over her companions. After a series of events transpire that sees the local monastery ransacked by mysterious monsters, she embarks on an adventure that sees her coming into contact with two other individuals who join the fight. You have the freedom to customize these characters as you wish, although each comes with their particular strengths and weaknesses. Edward is the strength attacker and can increase his proficiency in wielding his fists and many other weapons. Kadelka is strong in magic and the third character can do both. You gain points as you level up and these can be allocated to increase life, magic, strength and many other statistics that contribute to your chances in battle. Each encounter can strike at random, whirling the screen into turn-based dungeon environments. The combat system has depth but its implementation is simple, graceful and fun. At around 20 hours of playtime, Kadelka might seem relatively short for an RPG, but on its own, in tense and intimate terms, this length makes perfect sense. You'll become immersed in a world of magic, alchemy, grotesque monsters, horrific deeds and desperate people. You simply owe it to yourself to try this one out. Guardian's Crusade follows the tale of a young knight who stumbles across an orphan monster in the forest just outside his village. Upon finding this baby monster, the knight experiences a vision, enticing him to return this creature to its home in God's Tower. Now the gameplay, like the story, is hardly innovative, but a few twists keep things interesting. The character of Baby is essentially a virtual pet, battle companion and slapstick sidekick rolled into one. While knight is unable to control Baby directly, Baby will greatly increase your chances of survival during combat, depending on how you treat it outside of battle. Feeding baby, candy bars or healing potions will boost the creature's loyalty to you, and in turn will make it more responsive to your commands both during battle and on the field. You're able to instruct baby to fetch items in towns and on the map, and when it returns with treasure in tow, it's up to you whether or not to scold, praise or ignore its efforts. While the breeding aspects in the game are nowhere near as deep or detailed as a dedicated breeding game 
game, they are important to determining whether Baby will become a disagreeable traveling partner or a strong, reliable ally. Now, enemies appear on the map before they engage Knight in battle. As Knight increases in power, once aggressive enemies shrink in size and turn to run when they see him walking in their direction. Watching once feared foes cower in your wake is extremely satisfying, and is only one of the many ways the game actively adapts to the player's progress within the world. Visually, the game's graphics remain deceptively simple, with only a few embellishments in way of detail, completely rendered in polygons. If you fire up Guardian's Crusade expecting an epic confrontation between the forces of good and evil, you're destined to come away disappointed. Approach the game without preconceptions, and you're likely to be pleasantly surprised. If you can find it for a good price, it's well worth adding to your collection. Azure Dreams was a rather unique RPG that went against the tried and tested elements of traditional entries in the genre. You play as Ko, a young monster hunter from a desert town, and upon turning 15, males of the town are considered adults and are eligible to enter the famed Monster Tower, where most of the action in the game takes place. Over the course of the game, Ko will have to challenge the tower many times, collecting experience, items, and monster eggs along the way, and then teleport out when you've reached a point where it's too dangerous dangerous to continue. To keep things fresh, each floor of the tower is randomly generated, so treasures, rooms, exits, and monsters will change every time. One of the things that forces you to strategize in a non-traditional way is the fact that every time you enter the tower, Ko starts at the lowest experience level. He'll increase in level whilst he's in the tower, but it's only temporary. So in order to climb higher and higher each time through, you have to change other things. Much like in Pokemon, every type of enemy monster you come across can also become your ally. These little critters will travel alongside Ko and will follow your exact commands or you can set them to have a general AI pattern. They increase in level much like Ko, but their level doesn't reset every time you leave the tower. Each of these monster types has their own skill and statistics, and you can even fuse two monsters to combine their skills into one unique creature. On the whole, Lazer Dreams doesn't have the flashiest combat system by any means, but it's propped up by the level of collecting and exploring, which really helps push the game forward. It's one of the few RPGs that makes the grind feel more like a reward than a chore. Of that that reason alone, it's a game I can fully recommend. Sayuki Journey West had the privilege of being one of the last games released on the original PlayStation. It's essentially an SRPG that takes a lot of cues from the likes of Final Fantasy Tactics. The gameplay stays true to the standard formula and sees you controlling a group of characters on a grid-based battlefield. It all plays out in a turn-based manner, with the player having the option to choose from a string of abilities to alter the course of an encounter. But it's the differences between Sayuki and other SRPGs that truly make it stand up. First off, the maps on which you do the fighting have some interactivity, unlike most games. There may be a log you can cross a ledge with, then you can drop it down so people can't follow you. Sayuki also has very varied terrains. Rocky mountains, flat plains, towns and rivers are all places you should expect to visit. The other, more significant difference is that all your characters are wares. Wares are more than human. While they have a human form, they can transform into much more vicious creatures. However, only one character in your team can be transformed at a time, and they all share a wear meter. This depletes as you use your wear attacks, so you can't always rely on them to win each fight. Since only one character can transform, you have to be careful on who you pick to change. On top of this, some characters also possess the ability to summon, but they aren't the powerhouses most RPGs have taught us to be. In Sayuki, they power up your team instead. While a summon is out, a different stat is usually powered up. There are HP summons, attack boosting summons, and so on. But the closer your team is to a summoner, the more effective it is. As with most SRPGs, you will not find very many reasons to play Sayuki once you've completed it. However, before finishing off the game and heading into the final area, there are some nice little side quests that you can go on, mainly to gain money, access some of the greatest weaponry in the game and the like. These quests most certainly add to the replay value, so if you're fond of SRPGs and have played many of the other examples on the console already, Sayuki offers up a solid experience that any fan of the game will enjoy. The virtual craze of the late 90s was hard to ignore, with Nintendo's Pokemon and Bandai's Digimon in full swing. It was a no-brainer that a wave of clones would find their way to several consoles. With all this success, it became obvious that players liked to breed monsters in the comfort of their own homes, without all the mess of a real pet. 
Consequently, here comes Jail Code with its offering to the ever-growing selection of virtual monsters, Dragon Seeds. It's basically the same premise as Monster Rancher, in theme at least, but not in its actual execution. Basically, there's a new sport in town, and you get in on the ground floor by creating a dragon. First, you select from six different types of creatures, and then assign it to a random string of text that determines the creature's attributes. Then, send it out for a little training to build up its strength and power, and enter a few tournaments to win money and buy new weapons and pay for more training. Now battles are extremely simple and take on a sort of rock paper scissors approach as to how they pan out. At the beginning of each turn you choose two moves from a selection of six. It's one catch though, if your creature dies at any time during a fight, that's it, game over and you'll have to start from square one. You have easy control over your dragon and can utilize him to whip the crap out of your unsuspecting opponent if you know what you are doing. Now as far as the monsters are concerned, they're actually pretty cool. They're rendered in full 3D and there's a large variety of them as well. They all look really solid and the graphics are brightly colored and well designed. On the whole, Dragon Seeds won't be for everyone thanks to its rather hefty difficulty curve, but for those willing to give it some time, you'll more than likely find enjoyment from what the game has to offer. Thousand Arms is without a doubt one of the most innovative RPGs that the PlayStation ever received. The story sees you taken up the fighter's maze, a spirit blacksmith descended from a well-respected family, as himself and several like-minded heroes fight against the tyranny of an empire that has all but consumed the land. The story is pretty standard if I'm being honest, and it's nothing to write home about, but it does facilitate what Thousand Arms gets so right, and that's the gameplay. Now the action takes place across several 3D environments that the player can freely rotate with the tap of a shoulder button. The sheer amount of locations that's on offer has to be commended. Now one of the most innovative aspects of the game has to be the dating system that sees the player being able to date several ladies across the land. In order to do so, you need to provide them with a present and usually partake in a minigame to ask them out. Now you're probably wondering what the hell this has got to do with stopping the empire. Well you see, the more you date a specific lady, your intimacy level with them slowly rises and with Mayers being a spirit blacksmith, it allows him to forge incredible weapons or spells with the lady's help. Of course, without a solid battle system to back this up with, it would all be pretty pointless, but thankfully Thousand Arms provides an exceptional fighting experience. Most of the battles are one-on-one, -on -one, with the front character being the only one able to attack and use offensive magic against the enemy, while the backup party members are used for support and items, with a flurry of special effects that really draw you into the battle. Adorning the adventure are several anime made cutscenes that both advance the story and highlight some of the more incredible moments. It's got to be said that the developers did an amazing job in producing these works. On the whole, Thousand Arms is one solid RPG that is well worth seeking out if you like what you see here. It'll provide hours upon hours of entertainment. The Grand Stream Saga has an engrossing storyline that features a very linear quest. Of course, without solid gameplay to back up the narrative, it would all be meaningless. But thankfully, the Grand Stream Saga more than delivers in this department. It plays a lot like Secret of Mana with some elements of Chrono Trigger. As you wander through the series of dungeons, you can avoid enemies by just dodging them, which is a lot trickier than it sounds as they all seem to be able to outrun you. Once you're in battle, however, your movement area closes down into a small box and you transfer form into your armor, thanks to the rather nifty scepter. From there, it's a kind of tactical duel as your shield can block every attack from the front except unblockables when it's in use, but the enemy has the same capability as well. It's actually a lot more intriguing than it sounds, because the diversity of enemies and the varying AI keep you interested. There's magic as well, but you don't tend to use it, because unlike most other RPGs, magic points practically have to be bought, and besides, a good place swipe is often as good as many of these Spells. Despite the various cool concepts like special moves and counterattacks, the simplistic engine is the result of using the same few moves over and over again, and having a bunch of enemies with the same old recycled attacks. It does have the potential to become quite monotonous as you make your way through the adventure, but it's nothing that completely takes away from the combat system as a whole, just something worth mentioning. Now visually the world is totally 3D, so you can rotate the world on 8 points. On top of all of this, the game runs at a 
buttery smooth 60 frames per second. Simply a beautiful game to wander through. On the whole, Grandstream Saga is a solid RPG that is well worth the attention of any player who's fond of the genre. But don't get me wrong, there's a few shortcomings like the repetitive combat and the rather short campaign that clocks in just over 20 hours or so. But if you're on the lookout to try something new and have exhausted the usual RPG suspects on the PS1, the Grandstream Saga would make a solid choice for your next RPG to play. The somewhat immense world of Lagaya is plagued with mist, a thing that can only be defined as a dark and secretive presence that strikes fear into the hearts of everyone it touches. Van, the main character, lives in a town called Rimelm, whose high walls have kept the dreaded mist out of the area for quite some time. But it doesn't keep it at bay forever, and after a rather dramatic invasion, Van vows to rid the world of the mist and sets out to accomplish his goal. In order to do so, he draws on the ancient power of beings known as the Saru. By using a device that used to be worn on the wrist of virtually every inhabitant of the world. It allowed them to control the Saru, a group sent from the heavens to aid humanity. They are the most valuable companions and this is no more apparent than in battle. Although Legend of the Gaia is in many ways a standard turn-based RPG, it notably breaks the mold when it comes to combat. Without disclosing all of the details, combat is essentially broken down into two aspects, physical arts and Saru magic. The art system employed by this game is imaginative and engrossing. Rather than merely selecting a standard auto attack, you can choose from a series of directions which has the potential to result in special attack, oftentimes with great style and flair. This aspect of the battle mechanics really evolves with the story, which makes combat fairly fun from the beginning of the game to the end. Secondly, there's the magic, which revolves around the aforementioned Rasaru and their abilities. These range from standard attacks to elemental forces and healing options, which ramped up combat quite nicely. What makes them even better is that the more you use a specific ability, its power is increased. If you're on the lookout for a new RPG to sink your teeth into, the Gaia has got it all, for both veterans and newcomers alike. The Legend of Dragoon sees the player taken on the role of Dart and a band of like-minded heroes as they set out to find their kidnapped friends and take down an evil empire that's plaguing the kingdom. As with most RPGs, you can expect to find yourself visiting a huge variety of locations, which are all populated by a cast of NPCs that add a real weight to the world around you. When it comes to battles, this is where Legend of Dragoon excels. It all plays out in a turn-based fashion, with each member of your party providing their own unique contribution. The gameplay elements themselves are pretty basic at first. When you want your character to attack, you must press a series of buttons at the right time so that the attack can be executed successfully. If you complete the attack perfectly several times, it will eventually level up, but as the characters continue to level up, they will learn new ways of attacking. Sometimes the game will throw in a different button combination than what is usually asked for, so you must stay on your toes. Eventually, your characters will gradually come to possess the ability to transform into Dragoon. These are ancient warrior skills passed down to the current generation, and when your character becomes a Dragoon, he or she is much more powerful and resistant to attacks. Now each character is assigned a different Dragoon element, Fire, Wind for example. The attack ability is different in this mode, and instead of pressing buttons at the right time, there is an indicator on a wheel that spins, and you must press the same button whenever the needle lands on the correct spot. If you do this perfectly, the Dragoon will end the attack with a quick scene of him or her finishing off in a spectacular way. This is a game you'll want to beat because you can believe in it. You'll slaughter foes because it's fun to do, and you'll invest in the world because it's a hell of a lot better than the one you live in. If you can find it on the cheap, the legend of Dragoon is well worth giving a go. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 2 as that will be coming up soon so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date as well and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters Rhino, Skill Jim, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Dio, Omar, Awesome Jacket Dude, Pierre, Carl, Strider, Gamecube, Galaxy, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting my channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. Catch you next time.